Good, uh, I guess, evening, everyone. My name is Hadar Harris, and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law here at American University Washington College of Law. I'd like to welcome all of you, and we're thrilled to see so many people here at 6.20 in the evening, which is a hard sell for the law school. Um, but because of the important content of our panel today and our great partnerships, we're pleased to have all of you here, um, as well as all of you who are watching on webcast and those of you who are in the Twitterverse um, who may be following us tonight. Um, on behalf of Dean Claudio Grossman, the faculty, staff, and students of our law school, I want to welcome you and thank you for being here. I want to thank our partners for tonight's event, the Center for Constitutional Right, FIDASH, Howard University, um, for their partnership. And I would like to thank especially um, Maria Leone, who works with us as our coordinator of our anti-torture initiative at the Center for her coordination in setting today's events up, as well as our special events and continuing legal education team who've helped us with logistics tonight. A few words about our center uh, before we turn to the important content of the event this evening. Our Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law was founded in 1990 as a result of the wide variety of international law work being done at this law school focused on human rights and humanitarian law. Our center seeks to explore emerging intersections in human rights law to shape global conversations and to create dynamic advocates, both lawyers and non-lawyers. We do this with a variety of different methods, pretty much everything we can think up. We hold approximately 50 events, panels, conferences, seminars, film screenings like tonight's event um, over the course of a year, rapid response events which reflect on current events as well as issues that aren't getting enough attention. Most are held here at the law school. Some are held out in the community. Some are held in the cloud uh, virtually. Um, wherever that is. I'm still trying to understand where that is. Um, but all of them, most of them, are webcast as tonight's event is and are downloadable from our website. Um, we have a variety of core projects and it's my really distinct privilege and honor to be working directly with the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Professor Juan Mendez, on what we call the Anti-Torture Initiative, which is, seeks to expand and support implementation of his recommendations as Special Rapporteur to stop torture worldwide. We have a project on the human rights of persons with disabilities a focus on training and implementation on the convention, on the CRPD, a human rights education program which works uh, here in the United States in partnership with the RFK Center for Justice and Human Rights, taking law students into local high schools to teach human rights in classrooms, as well as a program for human rights education in places like Kali, Colombia, or Peshawar, Pakistan, helping to support and promote the teaching of human rights around the world. We have an initiative in human rights and business and a uh, growing and extremely important program on human rights in the United States. Our program on human rights in the United States both works on treaty implementation and the implementation of recommendations of, civil, of special procedures, as well as a pilot project funded by the Ford Foundation, which we always have to mention, um, uh, which works with legal aid attorneys in the United States to implement and harmonize the use of human rights in their very local day-to-day -day work. There is a lot going on. You can find... Oh, there is a lot going on, um, and we are honored and privileged to partner today with our dear friends um, and colleagues and comrades at CCR and FIDASH and, and Howard University to bring today's event together. At this point, I'd like to um, um, invite, I guess, well, I was going to say something substantive, but there are lots of people who are going to say much more substantive things than I, and as we're running a little bit late, I think that what I'll do is just say thank you, and again, welcome, and turn it over to Vince Warren, the Executive Director of the Center for Constitutional Rights, to frame our discussion tonight, and thank you again for coming. Thank you, Professor Harris. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, on this uh, dark and rainy evening. Um, 
My name is Vince Warren. I'm the executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights, and I would love to, in, to frame the discussion that we're going to have today. We have extraordinary panelists, and I'm, I'm, we're all very excited to hear how they're going to be thinking through uh, some of these issues. You should have the bios in your, um, in your material, so we won't spend a lot of time there, and we'll get right to the heart of the matter. Um, but I wanted to let you know that tomorrow is the, uh, the day, the World Day Against the Death Penalty, and uh, FIDH, the uh, the International Federation for Human Rights and CCR will be releasing um, the f report on the findings from an international mission which explored uh, through an international human rights lens how the death penalty is implemented in two states, in California and in Louisiana. And the purpose of this mission, in some respects, can be summarized by our attempts to bring together two values that don't always come to bet together in the practice of law. One is the law itself, and the other one is justice. Uh, looking at the death penalty, it raises the question sometimes, what does the law actually have to do with justice? And I think we'll be hearing from some of the panelists um, the role that the United States has or has not played with respect to complying with international norms um, and also what the, what the experience is like both for people on death row and for their family members. Thinking about it from an international human rights perspective, how do we bring the international and the U.S. perspective together? And we'll be uh, following up with a very practical sense of what one justice community in Louisiana is doing with respect to some terrible conditions um, on, on de of death row in uh, Louisiana. Um, I would say that um, in, in May of this year, uh, we traveled to California and Louisiana along with uh, Florence Bolivier, who is the president of the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty, who is one of our panelists. I also want to um, acknowledge two members of the CCR team that were on that mission, Susan Hu and Jessica Lee, who are in the audience. And we picked California and Louisiana for interesting reasons. California has the largest number of people on death row in the country, and Louisiana is infamous for the harsh conditions in which it keeps its prisoners. And our mission reached two overarching conclusions. One is that public officials in California and Louisiana do not, as a matter of course, apply human rights international analysis and framework to their discussion of the death penalty and policy considerations, and two, analyzing the application of the death penalty through a human rights framework reveals that both states, both states are in breach of internationally recognized standards. So that leaves us with the question of when, while the U.S. has played a very pivotal role in drafting some of the key human rights documents, including the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, and continues to hold itself out as a global leader on human rights, that the U.S.'s global viewpoint at some level belies the reality of what we're seeing as American exceptionalism. And by that, I mean that's where the U.S. chooses which internationally accepted standards and obligations it will and will not follow. And the ambivalence I would submit to you is very heightened and stark and disturbing in the context of the death penalty. Very quickly, with respect to California, um, there are 727 individuals currently on death row, including 19 women, and an average of 20 new judgments of death happen each and every year. California is the leading death penalty state in the United States, and its death row is far more populous um, and contains nearly twice as many condemned prisoners and men and women as its nation's second largest death row, which is Florida. The, uh, one of the things that we found in looking at a particular aspect of the, the experience in California was what it was solitary confinement and what they call administrative segregation at San Quentin. Long-term administrative segregation is regularly given to inmates deemed to have gang affiliations and used to punish individuals who have either suffered infractions or have committed particular crimes. The way that they use the, um, the segregation is that they, many people have been in administrative segregation in almost total isolation for decades. And the, one of the pieces of the human rights experience uh, for, for folks in death row in both California and Louisiana is the following question. As the Supreme Court in the United States first uh, did a de facto moratorium on, uh, on capital punishment in 1972 and then pulled that back in 1976, we saw that states around the country were looking to add more process, more due process um, and due process protections to the death penalty litigation experience. But what that actually did was it creates this very interesting 
paradox, and that is that the longer that you spend on death row with the ability to do appeals and reconsiderations and such, the longer that you end up in what we found were very stark, horrible conditions that in some cases, in our view, amounted to torture. Louisiana, on the other hand, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, had, we found that it vi violates the uh, con the Convention Against Torture in some circumstances in international law on the prisoner on prisoner treat treatment. A lot of those people that are sentenced since the death, um, with the exception of two women on death row, are living at a Louisiana State Penitentiary, a former plantation that is called Angola. And this is an interesting piece. The reason why it's named Angola is because when it was an operating plantation during slavery days, a lot of the slaves were either from Angola or people assumed that they were Angola. And the fact that here we are many years later, um, and Angola still is a, a representative of the incarceration system and the death penalty system in Louisiana says a lot. The last thing I will say on Louisiana is that while the international community has moved towards an abolitionist view, there have been a number of conventions and um, documents that have uh, outlawed uh, um, this, this type of practice or curtailed this type of practice, the U.S. has been moving in that direction, but very slowly. And there's a discriminatory aspect to this as well, which most people understand, but I think it's best summed up with respect to Louisiana. Um, so before I get to... Um, Professor Mendez, I would just leave you with this piece about um, discrimination and the use of the death penalty in Louisiana. <clears throat> the last time that a white person was executed for a crime committed against a black person in Louisiana was 1752. Professor Mendez. Thank you very much, and um, uh, I want especially to thank the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law, uh, its anti-torture initiative, uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights, Howard University, and the friends at the FIDH, uh, International Federation for Human Rights, for organizing this important event uh, on the eve of World Day against the death penalty. Um, we're, going, we're here to discuss the death penalty from a human rights perspective. Um, I want to congratulate the Center for Constitutional Rights and FIDH for launching the report on the death penalty in the United States and hope that it will further contribute to an active discussion of this issue across the country. Today, while international law promotes for abolition of this practice, it does not mandate states to do so. However, as I highlighted in my thematic report to the United Nations General Assembly, uh, in 2012 on the death penalty uh, and its relationship to the prohibition of torture, there is notable and progressive global trend towards abolition. Moreover, there is a clear trend towards supporting abolition of the death penalty on the basis of human rights law. Thus, it is of significant importance to frame the debate about the death penalty from this perspective. There are different human rights perspectives to the death penalty. The most common one is to examine the death penalty under the framework of the right to life. In this sense, Article 6 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights protects the right to life but allows the use of the death penalty under specific conditions, such as restricting its application for the most serious crimes and complying with all due process guarantees. <clears throat> International law also now explicitly prohibits the application of this punishment for pregnant women or for crimes committed by persons below the age of 18 or who were mentally disabled at the time they committed their crimes. However, because of my mandate as Special Rapporteur on Torture, I would like to focus my presentation today on the practice of the death penalty from the perspective of the right to personal integrity and the absolute prohibition of torture and other forms of cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. <clears throat> the prohibition of torture and ill treatment is absolute and non-derogable, which means, therefore, that it does not admit any exceptions. In this sense, any time that the death penalty is deemed to constitute ill-treatment or torture, it will be, and it is, contrary to international law. The exception of legal sanctions that is found in the definition of torture 
in Article 1.1 of the Convention Against Torture cannot be read, as some have claimed, as an exception for the death penalty. A sanction that is illegal under international law cannot be made legal by domestic law. Therefore, from this perspective, <clears throat> we need to examine what circumstances surrounding the practice of the death penalty may constitute ill treatment or torture, and more broadly, whether the death penalty per se can amount to these crimes, to, to, can amount to torture or, or, or ill treatment, uh, which would make it illegal under international law under all circumstances. These were precisely the issues that I examined in my 2012 thematic report to the General Assembly. The premise of that report was that there's a need for a new approach to frame the international debate about the legality of the death penalty within the context of fundamental concepts of human dignity and evolving standards about uh, what constitutes human dignity and the prohibition of torture and cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. I concluded in that report that although it may still be considered that the death penalty is not per se a violation of international law, there are strong indications that international standards and practices are in fact moving in that direction. The ability of states to impose the death penalty without violating the prohibition of torture and ill treatment is becoming increasingly restricted and put in doubt. To start with, aside from the issue of whether capital punishment constitutes a per se violation of the prohibition of torture and ill treatment, specific methods of execution and other circumstances related to the implementation of the death penalty often constitute violations in and of themselves. And this understanding is reflected in state practice and international, regional, and domestic jurisprudence. The two main circumstances to consider are the methods of, methods of execution and the so-called death row phenomenon. An examination of both of these issues reveals that states simply cannot guarantee that the method of execution or the conditions to the implementation of the execution f uh, faced by persons sentenced to death do not inflict illegitimately severe pain and suffering. Many methods of execution, including stoning and gas asphyxiation, have already been explicitly deemed to violate the prohibition of torture and ill treatment by international and domestic judicial bodies. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has also found hanging to present a real risk of ill treatment. Several high courts and UN treaty bodies have also closely scrutinized other methods, such as lethal injection, and have found that it cannot be empirically supported that in every case this method complies with the prohibition of torture and ill treatment. The Human Rights Committee, for instance, for instance has called on the United States that uses use lethal in injection to review its execution methods in order to prevent severe pain and suffering. The fact that a number of execution methods have been deemed to constitute torture or ill treatment together with a growing trend to review all methods of execution for their potential to cause severe pain and suffering highlights the increasing difficulty with which a state may impose a death penalty without violating international law. In other words, we should ask ourselves, is there a painless mode of execution? And the answer is probably no. Methods either involve unnecessary pain and suffering, or we have no way of establishing that they do not. Additionally, what we refer as the death row phenomenon also makes it very difficult for states to apply the death penalty without violating the prohibition of torture and ill treatment. The death row phenomenon refers to a combination of circumstances that produces severe mental trauma and physical suffering among prisoners serving death sentences, including uncertainty and anxiety created by the threat of death, prolonged solitary confinement, poor prison conditions, and the lack of educational or recreational activities. The European Court of Human Rights has held that prolonged periods of time spent on death row awaiting execution coupled with particular per personal circumstances such as age and mental state, violate the prohibition of ill treatment. The same uh, has been done by the Privy Council of the House of Lords uh, that acts as the uh, court of last appeal for, uh, Caribbean, uh, for some Caribbean nations. The Inter-American Court and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights have similarly held that prison conditions, together with the anxiety and, and psychological suffering, caused by prolonged periods 
on death row constitute a violation of the prohibition of torture and ill treatment. It should be noted that in the United States, the great majority of inmates in death row are held in solitary confinement or as euphemistically called administrative segregation, regardless of whether they pose any threat to the rest of the, uh, of the prison population. Because of its severe effect on mental health, prolonged solitary confinement per se constitutes cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, and in some cases, even torture. This is not to say, however, that if states were to carry out a capital sentence as expeditiously as possible, the risk of ill treatment would be avoided. The lengthy wait for execution is in many cases tied with the availability of legal recourses, compatible with the demand imposed by due process, which also point to the increasing difficulty of states to apply the death penalty without violating international law. In fact, states need to ensure that death penalty cases are subject to the most stringent respect of fair trial and due process standards, including uh, appeals and uh, availability of uh, uh, the, uh, legal aid for those appeals and uh, the availability of uh, clemency and pardon uh, recourses. But even if these circumstances did not amount to torture or ill treatment, there is a question of whether the death penalty per se can be deemed to do so. In fact, international law already expressly considers the death penalty to be a violation per se of the prohibition of torture or treatment when carried out against juveniles, persons with mental disabilities, pregnant women, elderly persons, and persons sentenced after an unfair trial. So there's huge categories of people against which the death penalty cannot legally be applied. Also, an increasing number of regional and domestic courts, including the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and the United States Supreme Court have held that the mandatory death penalty where judges have no discretion to consider aggravating or mitigating circumstances with respect to the crime or the offender violates due process and amounts to ill treatment. In analyzing this issue in my report, I concluded that there is an evolving trend within international bodies, which is also supported by robust state practice and regional and domestic jurisprudence that considers the death penalty a violation of the prohibition of torture and ill treatment regardless of the methods or circumstances of the execution. In my opinion, this trend is evolving, if it has not already done so, into a norm of customary international law. <clears throat> it is important to keep in mind that from the perspective of international human rights law, conventions are living instruments and need to be interpreted in light of present-day conditions. With this understanding, the notion of, of torture has developed over time, and acts originally considered lawful have become unlawful and prohibited under, right, under the right to be free from torture and ill treatment. A, a report presented in July 2012 by the UN Secretary General on the death penalty evidences and highlights the trend towards abolition. The report states that approximately 150 of the 193 member states of the UN have abolished the death penalty for all crimes, and in that, that, that in those states that retain it, there is an observable trend to restrict its use, to co uh, uh, um, including in the United States, uh, the use is diminishing, and uh, to call for a moratorium on executions that many states have observed. Also, in 2011, the UN General Assembly issued a resolution calling for a moratorium on the use of the death penalty with a view to achieve its abolition. In August of 2012, the UN Secretary General reported to the General Assembly that in implementing that resolution, several states had either abolished the death penalty, introduced amend amendments to abolish it, stopped its application for certain crimes, or had adopted a moratorium on executions. However, it is mainly regional and domestic jurisprudence which reflects the understanding that the death penalty constitutes per se torture or ill treatment and a violation of human dignity. In the case of al Sadun versus the United Kingdom, for, for example, the European Court of Human Rights held that whatever the method of execution, <clears throat> the extinction of life involves some physical pain, and that foreknowledge of death at the hands of the state must inevitably give rise to intense psychological suffering. 
Similarly, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights has consistently encouraged the abolition of the death penalty in Africa, expressing concerns that executions will constitute a violation of several provisions of the African Charter, including Article 4, which protects the right to physical integrity, and Article 5, which protects the right to respect of the dignity inherent in every human being. In Gregg v. Georgia in 1976, the United States Supreme Court Justice Brennan argued in his dissenting opinion that it is a moral principle that, and I quote, the state, even as it punishes, must treat its citizens in a manner consistent with their intrinsic worth as human beings. A punishment must not be so severe as to be degrading to human dignity. End of quote. In my report, I pointed to similar conclusions reached by domestic courts, including the South African Constitutional Court, the Canadian Supreme Court, and the Constitutional Courts of Albania, Hungary, Lithuania, and Ukraine. The global trend towards abolition is reinforced today by other examples since my report was published. Only last week, the government of Pakistan announced its decision to reinstate the moratorium on executions that is due to expire this year. In a report published in 2013, this year, Amnesty International claimed that by the end of 2012, up to 100 states had abolished the death penalty for all crimes, and over 140 are currently abolitionist in law and practice, meaning that no execution have been carried out in the past 10 years. Overall, the report found that 174 of 193 member states of the United Nations were execution-free in 2012. Even in the U.S., the use of the death penalty is declining, as I said before, from a high of 98 executions in 1999 um, to 43 in 2011 and 2012, respectively. In March of this year, Maryland abolished the death penalty, making it the sixth state in six years to do so. So in conclusion, based on these arguments, I find that even while it may still be theoretically possible to impose and execute the death penalty without being against the absolute prohibition of torture and ill-treatment, the rigorous conditions that states must apply for that person, I'm sorry, for, for that purpose, make retention of capital punishment costly and impractical and not worth the effort. Even with such, such conditions, states cannot guarantee that in all cases the prohibition of torture will be scrupulous, scrupulously adhered to. In addition, based on the global trend towards abolition, and although my report did not aim to determine the existence of a customary norm, I firmly believe that a customary norm that prohibits the death penalty under all circumstances because it violates the prohibition of torture and ill-treatment is at least in the process of formation. States need to re-examine their procedures under international law because their ability to impose and carry out the death penalty is diminishing, as these practices are increasingly viewed to constitute torture or ill-treatment. It is an important need that we have today, especially since in, uh, there are difficult situations created, for example, by the fight against terrorism or drug trafficking that create new opportunities to, uh, that some states have claimed for the reintroduction of the death penalty. And the, the sad news is that states such as Belarus, India, and Indonesia that had not carried out execution for a period of time have now again carried out some executions in 2012 and 2013. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to share these thoughts with you, and I really want to commend uh, FIDH and CCR for a report that I hope will make an important contribution towards the elimination of this uh, abhorrent uh, practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mendez. Um, I wanted to uh, throw a couple of questions uh, to Christine. Christine, um, Mr. Mendez laid out, I think, the international framework um, beautifully um, and gives us a real sense of the way that the world is moving and perhaps the U.S. is not moving there as quickly. Um, there was one piece that I thought was very interesting, which is where he's discussing the mental suffering around death row phenomenon, things like the, being under the threat of death, prolonged isolation, poor conditions. None of us here know what it's like to be on death row, and uh, I'm assuming most of us here don't even know what it's like to be in partnership and love someone that's on death row. How can you um, help us understand what that mental suffering and what those conditions are like from your perspective? 
Okay, so um, I'm married to someone on death row since uh, 2008. And uh, prior to that, I, um, I work as a paralegal at the Federal Defender's Office in Sacramento. And all of the cases I work on are people that live on death row. Um, one example I can tell you is uh, one of our clients that I visit has been on death row for a little over 20 years. And the only visitors he's ever had is his legal team because uh, the crime happened in California that he's accused of, which he's most likely, I believe, innocent of. But none of his family members, as probably most people who reside on death row are very poor, have ever been able to afford to come to California to visit him. So I think um, that's one of the things that um, is really uh, painful for people that um, are in prison in general is poverty makes it almost impossible for their family members um, to come to see them and it's painful to know they're in prison, probably even worse that they have a death sentence. And sometimes it's easier for them to um, stay away than to deal with it. And then there is the expense that makes it almost prohibitive for them to travel or to um, come to see them. My husband was uh, 23 when he um, committed his um, crime or they accused him of committing his crime. He was 26 when he arrived at death row. He has children who have never seen him since that time because San Quentin is located about uh, seven or eight hours from where his children live. The cost of um, maintaining any kind of relationship with him, them is pretty much uh, prohibitive. And yet, he loves them, they love him. Um, children strongly identify with who their parents are, no matter what they have done. And um, occasionally, I'm privy to communication that his uh, daughter, who's 19, will write. And there, it's very sad things like, I just need my dad. Um, which uh, brings tears to my husband's eyes because um, I think he would uh, give about anything to turn back the clock to have change the lifestyle that he had, um, pretty much living in the streets. His parents uh, both were involved in gangs. He grew up in um, the gang life. Um, he did not use drugs, but he did learn how to carry a gun and how to roll up and stash guns and uh, uh, drugs in the house from ch a very small child on. That was that was the business, and so um, if he could have maybe gotten on the bus to the Andy Griffith show, he could have changed that. But that wasn't what he was born into. Um, living on death row. Um, I guess I can wait till you ask me more questions. But there's there's a lot of things uh, that happen even when they do get visitors that make it very difficult. Let me um, ask you ask you this. Um, from the perspective of the conditions that people are in, the isolation, um, the being alone, well, I guess the first question that maybe most people are thinking, what's your perspective on um, what people have done in their past life or have accused to have done in their past life that got them to death row? Um, and how does that relate to how the prison actually treats them on death row? Do you think that there, what's, your, what's your perspective on that? Do you think it's um, too harsh? How would how would you how would you describe the way that uh, people are treated? So um, there's uh, certain officers that have uh, the ability to think that they're there to um, administer the punishment. And I've actually had uh, conversations with uh, visiting lieutenants uh, oh, about a year ago. I actually wrote a letter to the visiting lieutenant. And then um, since I have a fairly good relationship with him, asked him if I could just do it as an email attachment. And he called me and said, oh, what have my officers done now? And, and I sent it to him. And within the course of one weekend, um, I saw officers forbid visitors to talk to um, visitors in an adjoining booth, 
um, forbid visitors um, to use the bathroom during their two and a half hour visit or their visit would be terminated immediately. Now these are people that have driven hours to come for a visit. Um, a visitor that came out, uh, a young man that had came out for a visit that generally doesn't come out for a visit, who's extremely mentally ill, had tried to commit suicide by actually uh, shoving pens into his eyes to get to his brain, was and his was now uh, blind, got to the visit with his walker and being led to the visit by an officer. And when he got right to the visit, the officer in the visiting room started screaming at him and said, you don't have your ADA vest on. You're not allowed to have a visit without your ADA vest. I could terminate your visit right now. And he was just frozen, just frozen. Fortunately, the other officer had some compassion and volunteered to go back and get the vest so the young man could continue the visit. Another um, young man came, this is all within a um, one, two day period of one weekend, um, with tennis shoes on instead of the state issued shoes because his feet were too big for any state issued shoes and they weren't going to ha let him have the visit um, because he didn't have state issued shoes. And um, I spoke up and demanded that they get a sergeant there who then approved that they um, let him have the visit. So those are the kind of things that um, this lieutenant said to me. He said, I knew when that officer signed, because in California they have a very strong union, that I was going to have a problem because for some officers, it's not doing the time, it's sticking in the needle that they think is their job. Um, another thing um, my husband said to me, they have um, different food plans you can have, and some of them are religious food plans like the Jewish diet or the halal diet or a vegetarian diet. So um, many of the men follow the halal diet, which is basically vegetarian in the morning and at lunch, and at night it is a, um, a, a clean meat substitute. And um, so the, the, um, often they don't get their um, clean meat substitute. And since he's, on, he's chair of what they call the East Block Area Council, which is a, a committee that has a representative from each yard, and then um, he's the chair, and then you're supposed to meet with the prison administration, he's often looked to, to um, stand up when there's a violation. So he asked to have the lieutenant come because nobody again had received their halal dinner, they had received um, the regular meal. And uh, the officer went to get the lieutenant and the lieutenant came back, uh, the lieutenant sent a message back and said he wasn't coming because he didn't know what the big deal was, you all are gonna die anyway. And those are the kind of things that happen on the row, the way they're talked to, the way they're treated. Um, not to mention the way the row is different and to begin with, you're not um, ever moved out of your cell without being in handcuffs. You're um, 23 hours a day in general. You do have yard maybe three days or four days a week, but even on the way to yard, you're transferred to yard in handcuffs. And then as you go out through the sally port, you stand in front of the gate and then you take your cuffs off. But you, um, my husband is a big man, so he has permanent um, calluses completely around his uh, wrists from all the years he's been in handcuffs. Um, a telephone is brought on a cart to the front of your cell and then um, the little sally port where your tray is slid through is opened and you can push a button that allows you to make a collect phone call for 15 minutes. So it's very restrictive and isolated even though it isn't technically ad seg um, anyway, but they're they try to pile on to that type of isolation in addition. Thank you very much, Christine. And on behalf of the whole panel, I want to thank you for coming and sharing that with us. Um, your, your analysis and your sense, I think, is really fleshed out for us when we live as lawyers in the very theoretical level, what this really means for real people. So thank you.
So, Florence, what I would be interesting, I think people would be interested in hearing your perspective on this, Florence, um, who's joined us from, from Paris for this discussion, who also uh, was leading the California portion of the delegation. Sort of following up on, I think, what Christine was talking about, and also in your capacity as looking at this issue internationally with the World Coalition, um, what are some of your reflections? Um, what impressed you or made an impression on you from California? And also, how does what the U.S. is doing or what you're seeing in California relate to um, the way the international movement is going? Okay, thank you, Vince, and thank you uh, to the Center for Human Rights for this uh, invitation. Um, I'm sorry for, for my English. Um, so uh, I, I've learned a lot uh, uh, together with uh, Susan Hu here, and uh, I've learned um, two main things which seem to me uh, uh, very paradoxical. I think that the situation in the U.S. is extremely paradoxical, and this is something which maybe uh, make the, makes the struggle against the death penalty very difficult here in the U.S. compared to other countries. The first paradox is that uh, you, you, as a, uh, in the World Coalition, we are very uh, you know, sensitive to figures, <laughs> and uh, each year we, we count the, the, the countries which are the, the executioners. And so each, each year it's, they are the same, huh? Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, China, and the U.S. Okay? So I just checked uh, the last uh, three weeks uh, there were executions in these five countries. Uh, so, of course, U.S. and China, it's not the same uh, amount, uh, of course. But uh, in this series, you know, there is this joke of uh, who is the, the one who is disturbing in the series. Uh, w what is disturbing is that uh, the U.S. are a democracy. So why uh, in this democracy is the death penalty going, and going on and going on? So the it's problematic because on the one hand, it's, it's a good thing that it is a democracy because uh, the issue of the death penalty is publicized. It's not a secret, it's not a taboo here in the US. If you want to click uh, on, uh, I don't know, death penalty information center, you will know everything about the death penalty in the past few weeks, okay? Um, so the, you have this, this knowledge which is, which is huge but, but uh, uh, at the same time, it is not enough, this knowledge. And that's why we conducted this mission. And although, you know, I'm aware of this issue since, I don't know, 10 years, uh, together with uh, Susan, we've learned a lot, of course, by listening to people like you, Christine, and, and your husband, but also to listening to lawyers, uh, judges, and so on and so forth. So. Um, what we, we've seen, but in a very concrete way, it's how, what you told Vince, how the practice, the very practice of death penalty in this country violates fundamental rights, okay? And it is not something uh, intellectual or theoretical. It is concrete. It is in a concrete way that there is discrimination. It is in a concrete way that there is this torture that Mr. Mendes uh, highlighted. Uh, the, the second uh, thing is that uh, it, all that is related, all the story of death penalty is related to the question of the state and the power of the state. What, what kind of state do we want? And here in the U.S., it is problematic. I, I speak very, you know, uh, cautious because uh, I, I, I'm not American, but it's, it's my perspective, okay? It's what I see. Here we, uh, and the death penalty is really a good, good way to, to see things. Uh, we, are, we, are, we face a, a, a very big difficulty because uh, normally uh, for, for, for centuries, people have uh, justified death penalty by saying it's the, it's the power of the state, okay? The state has the power to kill, okay? It was like that. It was not a problem. Today, of course, this is totally old-fashioned. Today, in international law, uh, and not only inter international law, in 
regional courts always say that the state has the power to protect its citizen, not only its citizen, the people who are on the, in the country. Uh, and to protect them actively. Uh, yeah, the rights have to be enforced actively by, by the state. And of course, the right to life, the right to fair trial, the right to due process, the right to health, and so on and so forth. The death penalty is the exact opposite of that for all the reasons we, we have already mentioned. And it's very interesting to see that you, you probably know that every two years there is a resolution which is voted uh, at the United Nations. Mr. Mendes uh, pointed that out. And uh, this resolution has been uh, voted by 111 countries last time in 2012. Of course, the United States opposed. And this is in December. And in January, in January there is a, a, a kind of uh, letter of those of the country which oppose the, 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 the vote, and they explain why, okay? And it's always the same argument which is put forward. It's our sovereignty. It's the sovereignty thing. So it's always this power of the state, you know, this is our business. Criminal law is, has nothing to do with international law. Okay, it's our business, it's our, our sovereignty. Of course, it's a total failure. It's a total mistake. But what is complicated here in the U.S. is that uh, the, the, the federal uh, power is weak as we can see it very well with the shutdown. I mean, it's, it, okay, it's weak. And all this death penalty thing is related to local powers. There is a book that, if you are interested in this matter, that you absolutely have to read. It's David Garland's book. It's called Peculiar Institution, the Death Penalty in the U.S. or whatever, uh, Cambridge uh, University Press, 2010. It's fantastic. And it really l shows very precisely how the death penalty is a matter here of local government, local power, local judges. And if you realize that 2% of the counties here in the U.S. are responsible of the vast majority of the death sentences, 2%, you realize how arbitrary this death penalty issue is. I mean, you live in San Francisco, you're, and you are a criminal, you will, you will not be sentenced to death. You go 10 kilometers uh, further, and you will be sentenced to death. It's, it's, it's incredible. So this is, for me, it's the major problem compared to, you know, other more centralized uh, countries, uh, even if you compare it to China, for instance. China is always uh, the, the most terrible countries, uh, regarding, uh, country regarding death penalty, but anyway, the number of executions has uh, dropped dramatically uh, in the last 10 uh, years because uh, we were able to tackle with uh, the question of centralization because it's a very centralized country regarding justice. So um, from the moment where the Supreme Court could uh, see all, examine all the cases, it, it has dropped down. So this is why I think that uh, we, we, we have to pressure uh, internationally the U.S., because we, will, we, we can expect nothing from the federal state. We can expect a little bit from the Supreme Court, but it will depend on many factors that we can discuss then. So we have, you know, and everything is on local, so we have to put international with local and to show how it, uh, uh, it, it's um, uh, challenging, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, Flora. I thought that was a terrific analysis, particularly in light of the weakness of uh, the federal, federal law, federal government, and how that this becomes a very locally state-driven uh, fight. And so, um, Mercedes, I wanted to turn to you about how one actually fights in those states. Um, and I particularly didn't raise this, the, um, 
the, some of the conditions in Louisiana because I wanted um, you to be able to share um, a really fantastic lawsuit um, that your, you and your colleagues put together to begin to deal with some of those conditions um, that the rest of the panelists were talking about. Well, thank you. Um, I am an attorney in Louisiana. I work for an organization called the Promise of Justice Initiative. And we were founded with the idea that there were a number of issues that our clients faced, um, clients on death row, that weren't being addressed in their criminal case. Um, but one of the problems that arises when you have clients on death row is that they have ongoing criminal proceedings. So if you're going to have a civil suit in their name, the criminal attorneys are going to clam up and get really nervous about, you know, what's going to happen when my client is deposed in the civil suit. So the Promise of Justice Initiative was formed as a way of addressing that. I work alongside my colleagues who represent them in their criminal case, and so every step of the civil case, we are working with the criminal attorneys to make sure that we're not placing um, these men, in, in my case men, in, um, in a dangerous situation. Um, and that's one of the things that makes death row really special and individual and litigating issues around conditions of confinement much more complicated than it otherwise might be. Um, so in Louisiana, similar to California, um, the men are on 23-hour lockdown. They're permitted one hour out. During that hour, that's when they have to shower, make any phone calls, legal or personal, get ice. Um, oftentimes, the men have to supplement their, their diets with um, extra food that they buy from the commissary. So that's when they can prepare that food. So there's a number of activities. They have one hour to do that. If they choose to go out in the yard, they don't have that one hour. So in, in, in many cases, they're discouraged from going out into the yard. And many of our clients choose not to um, for many reasons, one of which is that it's a pen in the middle of a field, essentially, in Louisiana, southern Louisiana. And I don't know how many of you have been to southern Louisiana, but it's very, very hot. And baking in the sun for an hour is not exactly an opportunity for someone to get outside and get fresh air. Um, so this touches on, on the lawsuit that I filed of June of this year, which is the extreme heat in Louisiana. I'm going to back up slightly. We have a brand new facility in Louisiana. It was built in 2006, um, paid in part by FEMA. Um, and when they built this new death row, um, many of the advocates in the state just assumed that they would install some sort of mechanical cooling mechanism because it seems kind of crazy to build a building in South Louisiana in 2006 and not have any mechanical cooling. And in fact, they did install mechanical cooling in every part of the building where the guys don't live. So the guard towers and the medical room and the visiting rooms, those all have air conditioning. But where the men are subjected to 23 hours of extreme heat every day, there's nothing. Not only that, they used dark roofing materials. They didn't put awnings over the windows. They just failed in any way to consider um, what those conditions might be. And so as a result, as you might imagine, the conditions are absolutely horrific. Um, the walls sweat um, with humidity. Um, there's very little airflow. Um, they have these giant fans installed, which I didn't know this, but actually once it goes, once the temperature outside is hotter than your body temperature, fans actually make it worse because they produce heat in their motors and they actually make it um, much hotter inside the tiers. They're single floor tiers, so the guys just essentially bake. Um, and, you know, we did some court-ordered monitoring this summer, which got up to 111 degrees, um, but we're confident that it actually gets much, much higher than that, because this was only a two-week period of monitoring, and, um, and we know it gets much hotter in Louisiana than it was for those two weeks. So I think conservatively, we're looking at about 120 degrees. Um, and this isn't just one hour a day. This is for many, many hours well into the night. There's no windows. There's just... Um, I forget what they're called, but they're, they're basically slatted windows. So there's just there's no air circulation whatsoever. When I visited the tier, um, I was amazed by just being on the tier and then walking outside and feeling the fresh air and how much cooler it was outside. And to experience it being cooler outside in southern Louisiana in the summer, again, you have to be there, but that's crazy. I'm from Canada, so. <laughs> um, and so we decided to go ahead with a lawsuit. and. Um, Many of you are law students. Um, you may or may not have studied prison law. It's incredibly hard to win a lawsuit around conditions of confinement um, for many reasons. One is that the Supreme Court just doesn't, doesn't 
acknowledge many things as being violative of the Eighth Amendment, but also because of a piece of legislation called the Prisoner Litigation Reform Act. Um, and thank you, federal government. Uh, and that essentially makes it very, very hard to litigate issues on death row. You have to administratively exhaust um, any complaints that you have, which is a really complicated procedure that has taken many lawyers many, many hours to figure out. But without lawyers, our clients are left to figure that out on their own. Um, there are attorney's fees caps. So there's been a huge decline in, in prison litigation in the, in the nation since the passage of the PLRA because civil rights attorneys, the fees are so low, they can't keep their, their, their doors open. They can't recoup the costs that they invest in experts and things like that. And so it's just, it's, it's unsustainable for private attorneys to bring prison cases anymore. It's completely dependent on um, nonprofit work, really. Um, and, and then there's this, there's this new, there's a provision that, that says you must have an actual injury. Now that's somewhat relaxed in the conditions of confinement context, but in many, many cases, what it ends up meaning is that you have to wait till someone experiences a really severe injury before you can really litigate it. So one of the things that we did was we looked at this amazing piece of legislation called the Americans with Disabilities Act which actually has these really affirmative and wonderful rights in, it, in there and um, is, a, is a fabulous tool that litigators ignore all the time. And so we looked at the ADA and we looked at our clients and we thought, wow, our clients, many, many of our clients are disabled under the ADA. Um, they have um, diabetes and hypertension and many diseases that, you know, properly monitored and with proper health care might not result in, but in these circumstances are absolutely debilitating. And so we added that to our litigation and all of a sudden many, many things open up to you um, and your burden of proof is very different because actually what it is is that the, the prison has an obligation to the people who are housed there to provide them with, so, with an environment that accommodates their disability. So um, we actually had our trial in August, and we are awaiting a decision. Um, but that, I think, sums up sort of what our, um, what our strategy has been, which is to try and get creative. One other thing I want to touch on, and I say this only because um, I think we have some future public interest lawyers in the room. Um, we don't have to live there. So when you're doing this kind of litigation, it's really important that you have a community-based approach and that you talk to your clients and you talk to advocates, you talk to family members, um, that you reach out to the broad community when you bring a piece of litigation like this because unquestionably people will face retaliation for this litigation and it probably won't be me. Um, and so it's just, I think, you know, just to say that, that it's important when you bring this when you're going to get in the field and you're, it's exciting and you're young and you're excited and that's great. And, um, but just remember that everyone who's on this panel has to be represented in that conversation, as well as the clients who, who can't be here for this conversation today. So I'd like to um, thank you, thank you, panelists, for your wonderful presentations, and uh, you all did a very good job of uh, getting a tremendous amount of knowledge and depth into a relatively short period of time, so that we could open it up for questions. So I want to invite all of you to please um, ask the panels panelists questions. There are two microphones here and I'm, I'm learning from, from Dean Dark who, uh, who did this masterfully at Howard uh, Law School um, that there's a microphone there, there's a microphone there. These are for questions. And they're not for statements and comments, and so uh, we really do want to be able to formulate a really interesting question for um, for one of the panelists to ask. So please think about that. Um, and as you're doing that, I'll, I will throw out a question to each of the panelists. And this is going to sound a little weird, but um, you know, we've heard from all of you. Um, I think the great everything from the great promise of what the law says and what the law should mean. Um, in, down through how we would advocate both domestically and internationally, what it is actually like on the row in Louisiana, what it is like on the row in California. And so the question that I have is that if the law is on our side and if the facts are on our side, what, is, what do you see as the biggest impediment? What is the biggest problem that you face in your advocacy to get people to actually move on? Would you like to, uh, would anybody like to start? And please, microphones. 
Well, in, in my case, the biggest impediment is um, the fact that we have to, you know, move along 194 countries uh, <coughs> and that it, uh, you know, we, uh, the, the, the special rapporteurs and the working groups, uh, the so-called special procedures on the United Nations, uh, clearly we don't have any adjudicatory or any uh, enforcement uh, powers. We can only persuade, we can only try to persuade. And, you know, it, to some extent we succeed. I think the United Nations uh, has lent a lot of its weight to the, the, the battle for abolition. Uh, and I, I don't think there's any international organization, you know, regional or uh, universal, uh, that uh, today would countenance you know, uh, retentionist policies on the death penalty. Uh, but international law is still in its infancy and it still, um, you know, it still grows little by little and, uh, and, and, and norms become accepted over time and not immediately. Uh, we, uh, we should be impatient about it. We should not have to wait another 20 or 30 years. Uh, but um, in the long, you know, um, history of the, of the death penalty, I think we're getting there. I think uh, a friend of mine who studies this uh, mostly from the perspective of international law, Professor William Shabas from Canada, teaching now in England, uh, predicts that in the trend in, in which we are um, uh, living now, uh, in the decline of the executions, etc., and the trend towards abolition, that we might see a full abolition in the whole world, maybe by 2027 or 2028. Um, and I don't think he's too optimistic. I think we are, we are getting there. Uh, but of course, that's not going to mean much for those people who are executed between now and 2028 mm -hmm. or for the people who are their families, their, their, their loved ones who have to suffer through all these indignities that, happen, that are associated with the death penalty. So, uh, <clears throat> I think international law makes a contribution, but it's only a contribution. It, uh, I, I, hopefully, we can provide some tools, but the actual work of uh, abolition and especially of non-execution of people who are in death row today <coughs> is a task that has to be shared among many and among, uh, and I'm glad that today I have the opportunity of being amongst you because I think uh, it gives me um, a sense that uh, we know where we where we have to go, and that perhaps we can go there together. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to answer the question, what's the biggest impediment that you see in your work? Money. I mean, it's just, it comes down to resources. There's just, you know, there's, it's very expensive, and it takes a lot of energy and a lot of people and a lot of time. And um, in Louisiana, um, killing people is good politics. And judges and district attorneys are elected, and until that changes, um, it's going to take a, a lot of grassroots organizing and a lot of resources that we don't have. Thank you. Christine? I think it has a lot to do with shame in this country. Um, one of the ways they convict people, one of the ways they give the death penalty is by painting people as monsters. And if you can do that, if you can isolate people, if you can build prisons in the middle of nowhere, and you can keep people believing that they're less than human, then you can get away with the death penalty. If you um, can bring people into the community from prisons all the way to death row, and if you can let people know that even if the crime itself may have been horrible, those are human beings, and when we execute them, we create more victims' family members, there are people that love them, and we start to bring them back into society, then people will move away from wanting to be a part of that. Thank you. Uh, I don't speak especially about the U.S., but uh, more generally, for me, the most, um, the biggest impediment is the um, hypocritical discourse. I mean, when you when you challenge death penalty, uh, people will always tell you uh, it's not the moment. It's not the time, okay? Or yes, uh, in France, of course, uh, uh, look, you, you, you abolished only in uh, 1981. Of course, it was too late, I mean. And it could have been made much, much more before. There was no special, you know, uh, event in 81. 
or uh, public opinion. This is always uh, what is put forward. We cannot abolish because public opinion is opposed to Generally, it's full. It's f totally false. They ha uh, I've read two very interesting studies from Death Penalty Project that you can find online, one in Japan, the other in Malaysia. It's William Shabas who did it in Malaysia. It's extremely interesting. It's a sociological analysis of the public opinion, and very often it depends on the way the question is posed only on the way the question posed. So, yes, hypocrisy is really the main impediment for me. Thank you very much for that. Um, we have a question, sir. Thank you for being patient. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was wondering what you propose as an alternative to the death penalty and how that would be different from the situation today. Well, you just start out with the hard ones, don't you? <laughs> Well, the alternative is, of course, that uh, people who commit crimes have to be, you know, prosecuted and punished, and they have to serve uh, whatever penalty is in accordance with, uh, with the law. But um, yeah, the question is, what would that penalty be? Well, prison, uh, well for, for serious crimes, it will, it will have to be a prison term. Now, whether, you know, there are some people who are working on abolition of life terms, uh, I don't think international law has gone that far. Uh, but the death penalty, you know, definitely international law and international practice um, is increasingly considered it unac uh, unacceptable. That's not to say that the people who commit crimes are going to, you know, be free to commit them again. They, they will probably have to serve uh, time. And what, what is the proportionate uh, uh, penalty for the, for the crime, crime that, uh, that, uh, that they have committed will depend on a variety of factors, but uh, the death penalty is disproportionate under all circumstances. It just is unacceptable. Thank you. Anybody else want to So no one has an answer to the question? Well, actually, I think he didn't answer the question. Let me sum it up for you. Oh. Uh, the he answer didn't the, even approach the question. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what he said, and then we'll move on to the next question. Um, and I always want to be in a position of having to interpret Juan Menezes. This puts me in a very good light. And the answer to the question, I think, was that there has to be some other mechanism, including a term of years. It's hard to say what those term of years would be, given the nature of the crime. But I think what the piece of it is is that the current process that we have going on now is so disproportionate proportionately bad, that one step removed from that, which would be incarceration, would certainly be a reasonable alternative and one that's practiced um, in many countries around the world uh, to great success. Could I answer the question? Um, in California, we have a couple of examples maybe that might address your question. Charles Manson was on the road during the time the death penalty was removed. He was serving the death penalty. He um, was removed and now gets life with possibility of parole. I think we all kind of know what Charles Manson was sentenced to death for. Probably a crime none of us are very happy with. I don't think there's any doubt to his guilt. The next time Charles Manson comes up for parole, he'll be 92. If he lives that long, he probably still won't get paroled. We have options for public safety in this country. We don't need the death penalty. Yes, uh, uh, what you say is very often uh, um, argued against the abolition, but it's, it's a very a strange way to put things. I mean, death penalty as it, in general and as it is practiced is a violation of human rights. Why would we say we cannot abolish it because we don't know by which instrument we will replace it? It's not the point. I mean, we have plenty of ways to punish people. It's not the problem. So death penalty resorts to another structure, mental structure. It's the idea that the society wants to eliminate definitely one of its members. Okay, And we argue that this is a violation of human rights. So uh, I really think it's a, it's a very... Um, it's a, it's a way of putting th things which um, it is uh, already an answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would go to the next, next question. And can I just have a time check? How much more time do we have for the panel? We have? And how long do we have? Do we have? Okay, wonderful.
Um, that gives us plenty of time. Yes. All right. Uh, my name is Samar Chatterjee. I came to this country in 1970. Is your microphone on, sir? I don't know. It is? You would be able to tell me. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. That are you hearing? Mike? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, and uh, 1970 and coming from another country like India, and I've observed the people with a little different perspective than those who are born here. And my, uh, I think, Ms. Florence, you pointed out that the current theory is the right to protect citizens. Now, in America, most people, as they grow up, they're brainwashed to not think about that, that the government has the right to protect its citizens. Uh, in fact, if you see that the belief is that the government has the right to commit murder or genocide, and that's fine, uh, and that's justified, or that should be. Unfortunately, uh, that leads to our great deal of fascination for death penalty. If I can just pause you right there, um, can, it, let's, can it lead to the question as well? Because okay. I think we're, we're, people right. are, I can yeah, tell, are very too, excited too bad, to engage in this. Too bad uh, you don't want to hear others' opinion. You, you I, want I, to only give your opinion. I definitely do. So I'll give you a question. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, the question is, how do we change this thinking pattern of Americans? Because, you know, as you see, when the president kills with a drone, in other countries, and probably pretty soon he'll be start killing people here in this country with drones. Now, how do we change this mental pattern that the state and the head of the state ha does not have the right to commit murder? Please. Thank you. Would anybody like to address that? Well, I, uh, you know, um, targeted killings. Uh, are something that, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons, I think also violate human rights. Um, um, except in the specific situation of, uh, of combat. Um, and I, I'm afraid that uh, President Obama's policy goes beyond the situation of combat and, and for that reason probably violates a, an important uh, human rights principle. But I just cannot conceive of that violation uh, justifying the other violation. Both the death penalty and targeted killings are violations of international law, and one does not and cannot be used as a justification of the other. Um, we should uh, wait to abolish both. I mean, we should work to abolish both. Thank you, and I would also just add to that it is a tremendous challenge to change public the public opinion around these two issues. One would be the, uh, the role of the government, particularly in, with respect to any criminal justice reform. And the second would be um, with respect to the inherent government power to begin with. It's a very difficult discussion, and it's, it's a huge challenge for all of us, which is always part of a campaign to abolish the death penalty uh, internationally and domestically, is how do you change hearts and minds as you articulate the law. Um, sir? Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Bob Griss. <clears throat> Excuse me. When the death penalty is raised, we often hear that the victim of the capital crime, the, victim, the families of the, of the uh, capital, uh, of the victim of the capital crime, are looking for retribution. They're looking for uh, a way of punishing the, um, the perpetrator. And I have three questions about, about this. Is there any evidence that the imposition of the death penalty helps the healing process for the families of the victim? Is there any evidence that the capital, that uh, the death penalty um, interferes with, with the, the healing process that the, that family could, uh, could uh, go through? Uh, or are there opportunities for rehabilitation of the perpetrator? 
which I think the first question may have really been uh, directed to. Are there ways of showing people before an execution that there are better alternatives for reconciling the victim and the perpetrator? And I'm wondering what research on th that uh, subject has, uh, has to offer. Thank you very much. So to restate the question, is there any evidence that the death penalty helps the healing process? Is there any evidence that the, the death penalty interferes with the healing process on behalf of the uh, victim's families? Um, and are there opportunities for rehabbing, uh, re rehabilitating uh, people who are perpetrators or alleged perpetrators that should be part of this discussion? Um, it's a difficult question because uh, it's a matter of uh, subjectivity. I mean, there are only individual cases. But uh, what I know is that um, in, uh, in my organization, so the World Coalition Against Death Penalty, which comprises of 150 organizations, uh, there are some um, organizations of fam families of persons who have uh, um, a member of their family has been killed and they are against the death penalty and they campaign against the, the death penalty. For instance, Murders Families Again for Human Rights, which is one very influent member of uh, our organization. Not only in the US, also in South Korea, in Japan, and, and soon in Taiwan. So I think that it's very difficult, you know, to, to say to people what they have to feel. I mean, uh, if they want to feel the, uh, if they have a feeling of revenge, it's their right. I mean, as soon as, as it doesn't become the law or the right. But on the other hand, there are many, many, uh, as I told you, uh, persons who think that the healing process uh, as you said, uh, has nothing to do with the fact that the, that the, murder, the murderer is killed. Be on, the, on, the, um, uh, on the contrary, it, it, uh, it, um, it, wake, it wakes again the, the pain. It wakes again the process and, and the pain. So uh, there, there are arguments on both sides, and I think that uh, one cannot... Um, uh, one cannot um, say that, generally speaking, families uh, are against the abolition. Uh, I don't have a problem uh, understanding that the whole criminal law is, uh, in fact, retributionist. I mean, societies punish because there are some values that we consider so cherished that we cannot uh, abide by violations of those values. And taking of life is one of them, but there are others, like torture, for example. We have an obligation, the state has an obligation to, uh, to punish. Um, at the same time, uh, the victims have a right to a remedy. The victims have a right to a remedy but the remedy cannot be that they have a right to determine what the penalty should be. Uh, just like, you know, if I'm a victim of a robbery and uh, the person uh, that, uh, that stole from me gets five years, I cannot say, no, I demand that it should be ten years. Uh, the state has expropriated the vengeance, and it has done so a long time ago. And the state... Uh, and so. The, the victims have a, a right to see justice done, but they don't have a right to a, to a specific type of penalty, nor to a penalty that is not imposed with due process. They, they have a right to see, pro, to see justice done through due process that respects their rights, but also the rights of a criminal defendant. And, and, the, and the right to a criminal de, of a criminal defendant is not only a due process right, it's also a right to a, to a punishment that doesn't offend their personal dignity. Finally, I think uh, <clears throat> although the criminal law is retributionist, that doesn't mean that uh, rehabilitation and reform are completely alien to the reason why uh, societies impose penalties. Uh, I would never give up on the possibility of someone like Charles Manson becoming a good citizen eventually. I don't give up even on General Pinochet and General Videla. Um, 
I have my doubts that they would, they would ever, you know, become valuable members of society, but that, uh, that cannot be the reason why we, we punish them. And so, although we have abandoned, uh, I mean, in most countries, we have almost abandoned completely the idea that uh, the prisons are there to rehabilitate uh, offenders, um, it should be borne in mind that that was and still is the original reason why uh, not why we punish, but the original objective of the penalty that we impose. And because of that, the death penalty uh, is unacceptable because by definition it is so final, it's so different, like the Supreme Court said, that it leaves, leaves no opportunity at all for rehabilitation and reform. Thank you. Christine, did you want to get in on, this, uh, on these questions? And then we can go to the next question. I do think that there is a whole area of restorative justice starting, and if we work with restorative justice, of course, our recidivism rate would lower in California outside of the death penalty. We have a 70% recidivism rate, which is pretty much a 70% failure rate, um, if you want to look at our criminal justice system. Um, also, I would say that there are often times that family members have asked not to have the tough penalty on the table. And the district attorney's office goes ahead and, and um, issues a request for the death penalty and, and prosecutes with the death penalty anyways, which is a um, very painful experience for the family members of um, the victims to go through for years afterwards. Sorry, I just want to add one thing. Or selective family members. So um, the district attorney will listen to the one family member who's really pro-death penalty and parade that person in front of the cameras and um, silence or try to marginalize the other family members. That happens all the time. Thank you for that. Thank you for being patient, sir. No problem. Uh, my name is Antonio. And just a quick question in, pertaining to the United States. Um, as you know, most of the people on death row are minorities or people of color. Um, how much of the impediment that we were speaking about earlier is due, uh, the impediment to um, abolishing the death penalty is due to racism, do you believe? That's a great question. That's a whole new panel discussion. <laughs> I, I mean, I think, I think Vince touched on, on this in Louisiana. Um, our death row is housed at a facility named after um, the country of origin of the slaves who worked it when it was a plantation. I, I don't think you can divorce race from the death penalty. Um, the, the area in Louisiana that um, the most death penalties come out of is called Caddo Parish. And um, up until a few years ago, it had, a, um, it had the... Um, Why? The Confederate flag, sorry, um, hanging outside of the courthouse. And um, juror, a juror, in, in one case, a juror expressed um, an unwillingness to serve on a jury where there was a Confederate flag outside, and he was struck for cause from that jury. Um, so I absolutely think that that is a huge, a huge piece of it. I mean, when, when cases are examined, the race of the victim is just one of the single biggest factors. Um, Jefferson Parish and St. Tammany are two other sort of leading parishes for the death penalty in Louisiana, and that was David Duke was almost elected governor on the on the basis of votes from there in the 1990s. I mean, it's just I just don't think you can divorce it at all. And, and many of the people who are part of his political machine are still attorneys in those offices and still hold elected positions. In Louisiana, we elect our clerk of court. So the entire criminal justice system is elected, and they are part of political machines. And I just I think there's you're absolutely right. That's a huge factor. You will see this is uh, something which is extensively dealt with in their report because it's really important in Louisiana as well as in California. And I think that one of the key of the, of the problem is the gap between uh, the definition of discrimination in domestic law and the definition of discrimination in international law because many people um, will tell you it's, it's not pur purposely that uh, there is a more uh, African, uh, American African which are on death row, okay? It's only like that, okay? And as I told you, as far as human rights are concerned, the state has an obligation to, 
to enforce them. So the state has an obligation to make things so as it is not discriminatory. And it's, so it's the difference between intent and effect. Okay, so it, it's, it's a major thing. In, uh, you, you will see it in the report. Yes, thank you for that. Um, hi. Oh, I'm sorry, please. Yeah, I, I think the principle of non-discrimination is a cardinal principle of international human rights law, and the rule of non-discrimination on the basis of race is particularly uh, customary international law uh, that binds all states even if they don't sign specific treaties. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really disappointed that the Supreme Court uh, decided not to um, contemplate the, the possibility of uh, uh, the, death, uh, the, the death penalty being discriminatory in impact, even if not discriminatory in intent. Because as um, Florence uh, uh, rightly said, uh, the international law principle in includes both. Uh, discrimination that is on its face discriminatory, but also discrimi discrimination that is as applied discriminatory. Um, and uh, I do believe that, it, uh, that it, it is important to analyze um, uh, uh, racial discrimination in the imposition of the death penalty over all figures uh, in, 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 in large numbers to, to determine impact. I didn't mention this in my uh, prepared remarks because it's not part of my mandate as a special rapporteur on torture. But uh, in a previous incarnation when I was General Counsel of Human Rights Watch, I had the privilege of uh, putting my name to some uh, brief that was actually written by people who know more about this than I, um, uh, jointly with the, national, uh, with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, we submitted a brief to the South African um, uh, constitutional court that uh, resulted in the abolition of the death penalty in South Africa uh, <clears throat> in which the, the brief really made the case uh, that it's impossible for a state to have discriminatory practices in its societies and not uh, even with the best of intentions uh, not permit those discriminatory practices to seep into the de determination of uh, criminal policies criminal punishment, and, and particularly the death penalty. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Kate Kelly. Um, I'm a proud WCL grad and also a former Ella Baker fellow at the Center for Constitutional Rights. Um, Good to so see you, thank Kate. You. Hi. Um, so thank you so much for having this panel today. My question is directed to Christine. Um, I find your um, perspective so valuable and compelling. And so, and I know that when I talk about this issue with a lot of people, my mom's a prosecutor, um, and I was working in her office when she was seeking the death penalty in a case. We had a lot of interesting discussions. Um, and I think one of the most difficult things when I'm talking to people about the death penalty is they focus a lot on the execution um, and not the time spent on death row um, and that experience and, and how, and I know you touched on this a little bit, but anything you can share to elaborate on this or share your experience and your husband's experience would be appreciated. So um, you can imagine um, coming, being picked up for a crime at 23, um, some of you probably are not much older than 23, and some of you are, like me, older. But when I was 23, life um, seemed pretty um, endless. It seemed like I could do just about anything. And um, I don't think that he probably realized what a death sentence was, even when he got a death sentence. But now he's one year from turning 40, and um, he's waiting for a habeas attorney with no habeas attorney in sight. There's 300 and some other attorneys on, uh, I mean, men on death row in California in the same position he is in. When he had his trial, he um, had a sentencing phase trial that was a mistrial or a, um, a hung trial. Um, and so it's a huge case. And uh, it would be very hard for a sole practitioner to take it, so it would be good if an agency could take it, but agencies are so overwhelmed 
and cases are so backed up in California that there's probably a good chance, if you looked at it, that he could die of natural causes before he'd have counsel. So those are the kind of things that weigh on your mind. Now, I know that when I uh, met my husband, I was already doing this work, and I had a very, very realistic idea that I'm older than him, that um, I would die before he got out of prison. But I knew enough about his case to know that there, he would probably, if his case was done right, leave prison. And then along came Prop 34, and I knew that if Prop 34, I don't know how many of you know what that was in California, but it would have eliminated um, counsel for people on the row once they got moved to life without possibility of parole, would mean that he would never get an attorney. And I almost died inside thinking that he would never leave prison. It would be okay with me if he got to leave prison someday like Herman Wallace, died outside prison walls. But I couldn't bear to think the fact that this man who was so great, that was born into a family he did not choose, but he dearly loves. He loves his little brothers. The brothers, he told me one day, a teacher told him that he wasn't expected to learn it to read and write. So he was going to show him wrong, and he learned to read and write. And when his mom, his dad didn't come home, but when his mom didn't take him to school, he took his brothers to parent-teacher conferences at 13 and 14 years old because he was going to make sure they learned to read and write. This man doesn't deserve to be executed. Whether he did or did not do, and I don't know, I wasn't there, the crime he's accused of, he should go home someday but he doesn't have an attorney, and he waits. And while he waits, he's a very good man that advocates for every other person on that row for their rights, for their conditions. And probably because of the abuse that he grew up in, he has learned to develop a great resilience for what he puts up with from the officers. And the way he's spoken to. And because he happens to be 6'5 and 300 and some pounds, he can stand by his door and he can say, you and I both know, if this door wasn't here, you wouldn't talk to me that way. And he will get respect what he can say to them about the little guys that are on meds or are seriously mentally ill, which is the majority of the row. You are not so different than them, and you'll die too, just like them, and you don't know what day it will be, and he'll bring them back home. We all have a reason for being here. I hope his isn't to die on death row. And thanks for asking that question. Well, thank you very much for that, Christine, and I think that's a very appropriate way for us to close out this discussion. Um, I do want to say that um, I hope that you were all, we tried to create a panel that was going to be able to frame the issue and discuss it from uh, the most theoretical level to the most practical level to the one with the human experience. And I think we did a very good job of that in a short period of time. I hope you'll join me in thanking this wonderful panel for their perspectives on this. of uh, FIDH and the Center for Constitutional Rights. Thank you, uh, Wa uh, Washington College of Law and Howard and FIDH for sponsoring this. And please, folks, uh, when you get a chance, take a look at the report. It's, it's outside. Uh, you'll get the first crack at it. And, and uh, the online version, share it with your friends. Post it, share it, let people know about it. It's an important discussion. Thank you.